76ers basketball is hot in Philly right now. 76ers are currently first in the Eastern Conference, 24 and 12, heading into the All Star break. Half a game ahead of the Brooklyn Nets, two games ahead of the Milwaukee Bucks, and five games ahead of the Boston Celtics. So we're sitting pretty. We um, have Joel Embiid playing at MVP caliber right now. Yeah, without question, he's the best center in the game. Now the question is, is he the best player in the game? We'll find out if he's the MVP coming up. Uh, he puts up numbers like he's been putting up here. Coming into the second half, there's no doubt he should be the MVP, and Philly should be sitting pretty once the playoffs start. Absolutely. A little setback before the All-Star break with the uh, COVID coming back positive for um, not po for um, Ben and Joel. Yeah, they had some uh, contact uh, contact tracing, I guess, through a barber that they both uh, came in contact with uh, a couple days ago before the All-Star break. And it looks like Embiid's going to miss the first game back against Chicago. And then he'll be back for the second game, which is on Friday against Washington. And it looks like Simmons will miss the Thursday game against the Bulls and also the Friday game against the Wizards. Both of them should be back for Sunday when they take on the Spurs at home in front of fans, finally. Well, hopefully the team can at least split those two games and go one and one. You know. Yeah, you would think that they should be able to do that. I would think the Washington game may be the easier game, but you never know. When you are on the road, the Sixers are not the greatest uh, road team in the league, and especially without their two top players, that first game back after the break is going to be difficult. Absolutely. 16-3 and three at home for the Sixers, 8-9 and nine on the road. That's been a problem the last few years for the Sixers on the road. Um, that, seems to, that seems to be when Embiid gets his, uh, quote, rest nights, for um, his uh, load management nights, I, I, should, I should say. on the road after playing the uh, game the night before, whether it was right. at home or if it was uh, back to back on the road. Yep. Yeah, he would seem to have to do some load management or he, he or his back would hurt a little bit after the game before. So, uh, but his load management's going to be uh, worked out for the first game back because he can't play anyway. All right, exactly. All right, now we have to... I don't know, are they having fans in, in Chicago? I'm not, I'm not sure if they're doing that or not. In Chicago, I'm not sure. I know. Yeah, I know. That, but like, like they said, there's going to be a limited number of fans for the game against the Spurs back at the Wells Fargo Center, but I guess some's better than none. Yeah, there'll be about three thousand screaming Philly fans at the game. They'll, they'll make they'll make the noise. We were, the Sixers were used to having three to four thousand anyway throughout the process. <laughs> that, that's a good point. But but instead of paying ten dollars for uh, two tickets. Uh, You'll probably be paying in the hundreds for these games. Yeah, exactly right. Oh, do we have some fond memories of the process? <laughs> <laughs> you sure do. Oh, the, str oh the, the, the struggles that they went through. My goodness. Robert Covington. What, what? Robert Covington comes to mind as the uh, king of the process. Yeah, maybe one of the best players that, that they had back then. But, <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's... Coach Brown was Coach Brown was there for the process, but he wasn't good enough to get them uh, to where they need to be right now. No. Uh, sometimes they say if the coach that takes you through all that losing can't help you with the winning, and I, I guess it's true with uh, uh, Brett Brown. And what's funny, you mentioned Brett Brown. Uh, the Celtics have been struggling this year, and fans up in Boston are, are calling for him to go. We, we sat here year, you know, the past couple years and saw Brad, Brad totally out-coach Brett Brown, and and think about how we could have a you know that could be our coach. Now Boston is calling for Brett Brown to be their coach. <laughs> well, they would regret that in a hurry. I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was been. I guess that's been that's been two of the last three years of the playoffs. The, the Celtics had uh, Brad Stevens beat the Sixers. Yep. Once once they did it in five games, that would have been three years ago. And they beat them, of course, four straight last year. Four straight without Ben Simmons. So it'll be. Yes, it, I, I hope Simmons. that we get to see a, a healthy Sixers team this year in the playoffs. I, you know, I hope we can get Joel and Ben there, and ideally as the number one seed. Yeah, and ideally with uh, some added help on the bench and maybe an added starter. You never know. Right, which which will lead us to our next next topic: uh, trades. And uh, Daryl Morey 
It's 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 ninety nine percent. He's going to make a move. Just what that move's going to be and what it's going to take to get that player is what is the question. Now Kyle Lowry, Kyle Lowry's been the number one. Yep. Yes. And wouldn't that be nice to see a Villanova product come back to Philadelphia, where he's from, and lead the Sixers to an NBA title? That would that would cap a, you know a great career for Kyle. He's he's thirty five years old. You know, probably in his last two years of of you know productive play. The question is. Yeah, to let him go. See, I, I guess he's on the last year of his contract with them. All right. Um, I don't know. We'll probably take a couple draft picks, and I, I don't know which players they'd be interested in. I mean, there's there, there's a few I wouldn't mind seeing off the Sixers, but... Uh, I think the two you're, you're referring to would obviously be Mike Scott and... I'm sorry. Mike Scott, Mike Scott and, and Danny uh, Green. I'm sorry. I was looking Danny up... Kirkmaz as well. I was looking up Kyle Lowry's contract. He... Yeah, he's at a one-year, thirty million dollar contract with the with the Raptors. So, thirty million. So it would it would take uh, Danny Green and Mike Scott equal twenty million. You'd still have to throw another player in there, which Toronto would probably release. And they're going to want draft picks. They're not they're not going to just give them to you for for trash. True. No. True. They would they would want draft picks, but. Uh... Yeah, I guess I guess just today when I was looking at some different things, I don't know if you came across this or not, Cash, but it, mm-hmm. it looked like the Sixers were talking about maybe bringing back Thaddeus Young hmm. from the Bulls. It's an interesting name. I've heard it thrown around a little bit. Yeah, I mean, a 35-year-old who, uh, I mean, he's playing uh, pretty decent this year for the Bulls, and he's also a defensive presence that, that could give them a different look once he comes into the game. Wow, hard, um, to, hard to believe Thaddeus Young's 35 years old. I think I remember. Oh, I, I, I remember watching his rookie season like it was yesterday. Wow. With, that was with Larry Brown as coach, right? <sighs> yeah, yeah, I think so. That's, that's how far back that. <laughs> yeah. That's how far back that goes. With uh, wow, that is young, and and I guess the other name that that that's, uh, Zach Levine has been uh, another popular name. Yeah, that's going to take a lot more than just Danny Green and Mike Scott. That's that. That's going to obviously take a Tyrese Maxey and possibly a Tobias Harris. Yeah, and, I, and the way Tobias has been playing and the way that he plays under Doc Rivers, I don't think they're looking to move him at all. So you're right, Zach. Zach, Zach Levine might be a difficult acquisition for him, even yeah. though it would it would be nice. I mean, me personally, I would. Let Harris go. You're getting a, a, a Zach Levine, a 25 years old, heading into his prime. And what a what a what a triple threat that could be with an Embiid, Simmons, Levine. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that does that, that, that does sound attractive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, we're going for a title. I, all, all the Tyrese Maxey fans out there that say, "No way, we can't let him go. We drafted him. He's our guy." We. I'm sorry. I'm getting... It's been since 1983, so if uh, moving someone like that's going to help win a championship, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to be opposed to that at all. I'm sorry. I'm getting. No, take your time. No, I'm trying. To, I'm. I'm hearing that you're, you're not. You're not coming through loud enough on the broadcast. I'm trying to fix your volume here. Okay. Hey, it's our first show, guys. We're working out all the kinks right here. Yeah. There we go. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, is it, is it louder now for you? I don't know. I, I hear you fine. It's, it's it's not coming through on the station that, that well. Okay. All right. Okay. okay let's get back to... So Thaddeus Young was another name. Um... Also, possibly. Yeah, former Sixer. Now, another former Sixer, maybe to come back. Um, big, a big man who can uh, take up some space, but he also shoots the three. And I don't think it would cost you more than a second round pick to acquire Mike. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I, I, I agree. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, it seems seems you're coming through better now. I, I got I got I can hear him on the chat. I see you Good. guys. Shout out to Davidson Crooks. What's good? Okay, good. All right. There we go. Okay. And I'm sitting here. Uh, 
sitting here, I have the Flyers game on in the background. It's not looking good. <laughs> For any Flyers fans who are listening to us, they're losing to Buffalo tonight. <laughs> Playing a Buffalo team that couldn't muster a goal last week in two games against the Flyers. Carter Hart, Carter Hart allows three in the first period. Yes, and they actually pulled Carter Hart in the last goal that went in. It was a crazy bounce off the boards and hit Elliott in the back and went in the net. So oh. everything's everything's going against the Flyers at this point. That's not going to help Carter Hart's confidence at all, getting pulled in the first period against a Buffalo Sabres team. That's 6-14-3. No, it's not. And I guess um, it's one of those things where I've seen a lot of people making the comment, well, it's the second year and, you know, you can have that sophomore slump. But, yeah, a lot of high hopes for him, and it just isn't panning out so far this year. Seems to be a theme with Philadelphia sports lately. Yeah, unfortunately it does. Yeah. Reese, Reese Hoskins comes to mind when you talk about second-year slumps, but I don't know if anybody could, uh, you know, live up to the first tw- first 25, 30 games of his career. But like True, we, which were, yeah, when she set records doing that with hitting home runs, yeah. and we, we thought that we had a guy who was going to be uh, all-star first baseman for years to come, and... Yeah. Boy, when he struggles, he really struggles. But like you say, when in the major leagues, the pitchers are going to make adjustments, and when the pitchers make adjustments, the hitters need to make the adjustments as well. And, you know, it's going to take Reese a while. He, he has a big swing, and he, he tries to sh- shorten his swing. But this will be a key year for him. This is definitely a pivotal year for Reese. And Yeah, I think I, I think it is also. It's and, uh I guess he, I guess he signed a, an extension this this off season with the Phillies, but it wasn't it wasn't uh, a long extension. No. And yeah, and, and one of the things that, that comes to mind with him too was during the Gabe Kapler years that they were always trying to get him to change his swing, and I, I don't know how much that screwed him up, and I don't know with this being the second year now uh, playing under Joe Girardi if it's going to make a difference or not. Hopefully, it will. I hope so. I mean, that's a, I definitely think that's an. A great upgrade at manager. Joe Girardi's a, a proven winner. Gabe Kapler was a little out there with his theories. And I, yeah, that was another one of those uh, analytics. Build up experiments. Let's, let, let's see what we can do with this guy as coach. And uh, hmm. that, didn't, that didn't work out too well. Yeah, they, they brought Gabe in and he, they said, how are you going to manage the team? And he said, analytics. And they said, you're hired. I would have said, you're, you're, you're fired. Get out of my office. But apparently that's the way, that's the way Clintac liked to run a team and that's why he's no longer employed with the Phillies as well. So, Dave, yeah, well, that, well yeah, that, that analytics works well if you don't mind missing the playoffs. Right. So, you know, a Dave Dombrowski-led team's already already shown uh, a lot of improvement in the bullpen, which was definitely our uh, not our strong suit last year, to say the least. Well, yeah, that would be an understatement. I don't, I don't know if this, this bullpen could, could be any worse, and hopefully... Uh, it it was one of those things. I, I think what what I was looking at from last year out of the, the games that the Phillies played with the shortened season, I think in forty nine of those games the Phillies actually had the lead. Amazing, and that and that was only second in baseball to the Dodgers. Amazing. So yeah, yeah. That I think that goes uh, that goes a long way to explain how uh, the pitching let the team down last year. <laughs> Yeah, the, the names that they had in that bullpen last year, it's 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 astounding that they could go into a season with guys throwing 89, 90, 91 miles an hour. It, it just wasn't going to cut it. We knew it. We said it. And we were right. And they let the, that, that basically was the reason they didn't make the playoffs. This year, they had flamethrowers coming out of the pen. So it should be it should be an exciting team to watch. I think when you look when you look now at baseball, I think the the team to to look to is the uh, Tampa Bay Rays, and look at look at how they, they put their bullpen together. And if you can put a bullpen that good, hey, look, they were only in the World Series. Exactly. We we plucked we plucked one of the guys away with Alvarado, and he seems to have gotten himself in shape, and he's he's ready to win. He said he let himself go a little bit last year, and but, I mean he still went to the World Series, obviously. But the year before was his best year. But he looks to have a a bounce back year this year, and and the signing of of, of Kinsler is just that, that's a, that's a great last minute pickup. I heard um, Bryce Harper had something to do with that signing. Well, and it, anything that's anything that's going to help, um, mm-hmm. and especially I mean Bryce, Bryce has had a lot of uh, 
influence on, on, on saying players he, he likes being around and, and to play with. It's just now it's time for him to come out and be the Bryce Harper we expected. Absolutely. Bryce is a big fan of uh, JT. He seemed to force the... Uh, our what's our that? favorite catcher, JT. Our favorite catcher, JT Romuto. We've we've, ta- we've taken heat on YouTube. I mean, I'm sorry, on YouTube. On Twitter, night after night, best catcher in baseball, JT Romuto. Uh, last I checked, JT hasn't played in a playoff game. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that, last time I checked, if he, it, what, I can't remember a big hit JT Romuto's gotten for the Phillies. The only one, the only one that comes to mind is the Grand Slam against the Braves two years ago. Yep. And he turns 30 years old in nine days. So yeah. they committed five years, five years, 115, 115 million to a catcher that's on the second half of his career. Yeah, he even last year had a couple injury problems. Uh, yeah. I guess it was, what, what, I guess that was uh, injury to his leg and hip last year at one point. Yeah. Which definitely sees a transition to first base probably by the third year of the contract. Yeah, at some point you, you you would think. And one thing I think too this 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 year that's um, not in the Phillies' favor uh, is the fact that there's no DH now in the NL, so he won't be able to. His bat will be out of the lineup when he's out of the lineup. Obviously, I mean, right. it gives it gives him an option off the bench, but uh, the games that he's either resting or, or not or not not playing, his bat can't be in there as DH. All right. Yeah, did, uh, I don't know, Cash. If I don't think we we discussed this before because um, we really didn't have a whole lot of uh, Phillies talk here for the first week, but it seems like we do. Mm-hmm. The uh, that injury that Therese Hoskins with his, with his wrist and the surgery he had, I didn't hear anything to where uh, he's having any problems with that so so far. So that's good. No, I haven't either. I haven't heard any problems with recent and the injury. Yeah, that was on. Um, I guess that was that was a wrist injury on his non-throwing hand, which is kind of rare. But <laughs> well, a power hitter, it's still going to affect your swing, so, you know. Of course, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, gonna... just, it's just how it's just one of those things where it, you know you get it, and it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Though with a wrist injury, that's something, and yeah. and hopefully it's one of those things that uh, it's been fixed and it's not going to be a problem for him going forward. Because if the Phillies are going to do anything this year, he's going to have to have his best year so far with them. Absolutely. Yeah, in my opinion. I mean, there's there's a lot of – I mean, that's the thing, too. When, when, when at least I look at the Phillies and I look at the pitching staff and I look at their current projected roster, there's – to me, at least what comes to mind, there's, there's too many question marks. There's a definite hole in center field. Then you have a question mark in left field, in my opinion. You have a question mark with Reese Hoskins at first base. Gene Segura playing second is a question mark. And how's Alec Bone going to do in his sophomore season? Right. So, a lot of questions, and um, one of those things where, fortunately, it's it's not a short uh, a shortened season this year, and hopefully, these guys can can produce the way that uh, we we've seen them produce in the past. And if and if Bone can just uh, carry on like he did last year, that's only going to be a bonus for him. I think the center field situation kind of worked itself out. I think you're going to see Odubel Herrera start opening day in center field with the injury to Adam Hazley. I think that either him or either him or Scott Kingery. I think, um, but I would I would agree with you. It, it, it's, it's looking more like it's going to be Odubel uh, Herrera. Yeah. Now we'll see how the fans react to that. I don't, you know, with Odubel's domestic domestic um, violence that made him be suspended for the whole season last year. If he, if, he, if, he, if he comes out hot and spent 400 and hit home runs and stealing bases, I don't. I, I think a lot of fans, even though that will still be in their mind, I, I think it'll it'll be something yeah. that uh, becomes secondary. Now, and now, if he's playing bad, well, he's he, he's going to get the brunt of it if he's playing bad. Right. And we talk Reese Hoskins. Reese Hoskins, two years ago, 2019, led the NL in walks. Let's not forget he he, he walked 116 times. He batted two twenty six, but his own base percentage was three sixty four. So the the guy has an eye, <laughs> but true, he, true, he does, he does, and, and uh, he he um he always seems to have that two strikes on him and run a deep count. Yeah, and 
Not really a base stealing threat, though. <laughs> uh, ten in his career. <laughs> yeah. yeah, walking Reese Hoskins. Uh, yeah, you know, um, he's not going to be taken off anytime soon. I mean, he's had a career 366 on base percentage. Now, you know, you, you may say, yeah, but he's hitting 239. You look at a guy like Real Muto, he'll hit you 270, but his on base percentage will be only be 320. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that's that's another complaint I've always had since he, since Real Muto's been there. I mean, he strikes he strikes out, I, I think, way too much. Yeah. Yeah, on base is three three twenty eight for his career. That's his that's his on base percentage. Five hundred yeah. five hundred and fifty nine strikeouts and twenty six hundred and twenty nine at bats. Yeah. Well, and, You're looking at and one out of four. Too, <laughs> the thing too about about bringing him back and signing him to five years and, and giving him that huge contract of twenty three million or, or more per season. And I guess it was one of those things too where the Phillies looked at it, and at least from a standpoint of the fans and from media and different things, it was, well, look at the pitcher that you gave up, who's now a starting pitcher and seems to be like a dominant pitcher potentially for the Marlins and, and Sixto Sanchez, and now you're going to have a guy for two years and, he, and he's just gone? I know. And Sixto's going to be a Cy Young candidate year after year, I think. That's going to be tough to watch, Chris. Tough to watch. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Just like last year, it was tough, it was tough to watch... Uh, Jorge Alfaro, when uh, when he was playing against the Phillies, yeah. he batted pretty well. I even remember him him uh, with the game when he hit uh, in one game. Yes, <laughs> I, mean, I, I was perfectly fine with keeping him. And look what they could they could have added a pitcher for 115 million dollars instead of this. We, uh, uh, we have a, a rotation this season with Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler. After that, you could flip a coin. Uh, Chase Anderson, uh, uh, Vince Velasquez. Uh, Matt Moore. I mean, these guys are washed up twice. They needed to add yeah. p- starting pitching. and $115 million to a catcher. I know Philadelphia is saying, what are you talking about? He's the best catcher in baseball. Best catcher in baseball? You're talking a guy hits 266. Uh, an average catcher is going to hit you 250, 255. Uh, I'll take the 11 less points and have a, have a, have a stud pitcher for four years. Correct. Correct. If, it, if, it, if it's someone who you're going to put there, in, who's going to make that bullpen even more solid, or especially a starting pitcher, when you're looking at the fact that uh, once you get past Zach Eflin, Aaron Nola, and Zach Wheeler, uh, yeah, it's it's like tossing a coin. I, mean, I, I don't. Exactly. I, I, I can't believe that Vince Velasquez has even come back to is even back on the team, and. From what I saw just recently, I think they're talking about maybe Spencer Howard starting either in the minor leagues yeah. or putting him out in the bullpen. Well, that's maybe what a, a long reliever or. A, or... I, yeah, I, I would I would assume, or just to put another arm out there, um, or just to keep him around on the big league roster, or if something happens and they need a double header or whatever, he can fill in as a starter as well. I'm yeah, and Bobby, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think we talked about this a whole lot, though, with baseball this year. I, I, I guess it's my understanding that they're going to keep the uh, doubleheader at seven innings per game. Yeah, which the, uh, the classic baseball fan, I believe, does not like very much. I don't. Yeah, I just, I don't think a seven inning game is a, is a major league baseball game. That's that's, that's just not. You know, no, that's, pleasant that's, to watch. That's, that's, that's something you see in softball or local. Right yeah, now. yeah. I mean, as long, as long as they keep it under maybe five 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 double headers, I'm I'm okay. But I don't want to see as many as we saw last year. I know they were trying to squeeze a lot of games into a shortened season, but hopefully it's not a, a regular thing. Well, and the thing too that that put a sour taste, I think, in the in, the, in at least in my mouth and in the mouth of uh, a lot of Philadelphia fans last year was the fact that the Phillies weren't very good at double headers. No, well, when you have a bullpen like that, you're not going to be. I'm uh, I got Shane coming in on the the uh, chat board here. Aaron Nola overrated in Capitals. Yeah, we'll put some exclamation points behind that because that's exactly <laughs> true. I am not an Aaron Nola fan. Let's see what 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 big game has Aaron Nola won for the Phillies? Uh, let's, um, let's think here. Mm, let's think. None. Yeah, none. None. Yeah. Oh, Any. Hey. Anytime we had a big game late in the season, 
Aaron Aaron Nola's on the mound. Up oh, five runs, five innings. All you gotta know is all you gotta know about Aaron Nola is look at his September uh, ERA. And that's about all you need to know. Yep. I mean, you ask. You, I, I, you, I remember. I remember last year. It was the last game of the season against Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay had already clinched a playoff spot. Oh boy. And he gave the ball to Aaron Nola. He still needed a game to win. He, I, I don't think he got out of the fourth inning. Nope. They got swept in that series. Yes, they did. <laughs> A team team that had given up. That's like, you know, that's like the Chiefs not not starting Mahomes in Week 16, and and you know them still them still winning. That, that's that's how it was. Tampa Bay was throwing in the towel, and the Phillies still couldn't come up with one victory, one victory. Yeah, with their so-called ace on the mound. Exactly. Well, and what was frustrating last year too was the fact that as good as the, or I should say, as bad as the National League was. The Phillies coming into the last ten games of the season, I believe they needed to win two, and they couldn't do it. Unbelievable. Yeah, and it would, and they even had uh, Nola and Wheeler with a couple starts, and I, th- I think the only starter that won in, in that stretch was Zach Eflin. Yeah, I mean, you ask me, the the, the ace of the Phillies is Zach Wheeler. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. My only. My only drawback to Zach Wheeler is, is he going to have any problems this year zipping his pants? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully everybody out there, if they're listening, understands that story. He missed a couple games last year because apparently zipping up his pants, he caught his finger. Uh, he caught a finger on his pitching hand. I think it was his index finger, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. In the zipper. And and then even when he came back, he had to fight through having some blisters and some sores on some sores on. Then, then, then he then he rip off the nail. It, it, it could it, it was it was something like that. It was yeah. it was just like I can I can remember watching the uh, Phillies. It was a Phillies post game, and uh, it was after a game that the Phillies had just lost, and it was Michael Barr, and Ricky Vitalico, and it's like. And now, just to make things worse, and to think that you can't make this stuff up, Zach Wheeler will be missing his next start due to injuring himself, <laughs> zipping his pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, in, in a shortened season, when every game counts like two games, yeah, that that was a a fun thing to have to hear. Exactly. All right. Well, we've talked Sixers, and we've talked Phillies. Let's take a little yeah, break. We've talked- We've touched on the Flyers' struggle tonight, even though they're back. Uh, they're only behind one goal right now. Oh, they cut it to four to three. Four to three. Okay. All right. Well, we'll take a little break, and when we come back, we'll talk a little Eagles football. Yes. After the break, remember you are listening to Philly Sports Talk right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all things sports. Hey guys, it's Blake Henley, better known as H-Town Blake to some of you. Happy to announce that Faces Loader is back in full force. We'll be bringing that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done.
Hey, what's up, sports fans? You looking for a different type of sports talk show? Something you haven't heard before? You got to check out the BS3 Sports Show every other Saturday on 2 Live Steve's Radio, 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Sports talk at its finest. Always have great guests playing some good hip hop. You don't want to miss it. Make sure to tune in to the BS3 Sports Show every other Saturday at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern. What's good, fight fans? It's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what you want? Yeah. What you need? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live, straight from your mama's basement, with a crispy awesome white tea. <laughs> we are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh, yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Welcome in 
to the Neutral Zone. I'm your host, Robert Cavanaugh, and you're listening to IE Sports Radio. If you like big, nasty hits, if you like slap shots straight to the neck, if you like it when the world gets guys and the big boys get down, then this is your show on IE Sports Radio. This is the Neutral Zone. Our shots on goal always be true and straight to the net. If they are not, may be followed up, redirected, or change collected. Let's go on IE Sports Radio with me, your host, Robert Cavanaugh, and this is The Neutral Zone. And we are back on the air. It's Cash and Chris, Philly Sports Talk. All right, so we've had a great show so far. We've talked Sixers, we've talked Philly. Now let's get into the NFL team, the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, Eagles coming off a disappointing year, to say the least. We lost our franchise quarterback to the Indianapolis Colts. We broke in a new quarterback, Jalen Hurts, who the Eagles drafted in the second round, despite having a franchise quarterback in Carson Wentz. And it looks like now Jalen Hurts has got the seal of approval from the owner, so going forward, it's it's his job to lose. Yeah, it's his job to lose. He's got he's got the full confidence. I don't think we'll be drafting a quarterback this season. We'll probably sign an old you know a veteran off the free agency, just somebody there to teach him. Maybe a, a, I don't know. I don't know the way the way this team goes. I wouldn't be surprised if they did take a quarterback with the sixth pick <laughs> after, after taking one so early last year in the, in, in the second round. If there's someone sitting there, you never know on draft night what they might do. True. I mean, Dallas Cowboys just just gave da- Dak Prescott four years, one hundred and sixty million dollars. How many games is how many playoff games has Dak Prescott won? Uh, one? One is correct. Yes, one. One playoff win, $160 million. Was, was, that, was that against Seattle? It was against, I, I, believe, I believe it was. Yeah, it was against the Seahawks. Now. Yeah. Yeah, he's coming off a big injury, too. He's coming off a big injury. He's 27. He'll be 31 when that contract's over. If he plays up to that contract, you're going to tell me a four... You're, Potentially four to five hundred million dollar quarterback, Dak Prescott, who a lot of people said was behind Carson Wentz in the NFC East. So, well, I guess if uh, if you're a quarterback and can be a starter in the NFL, I guess the money's going to be rolling in now. These new guys coming out of college, getting drafted, and everything. I mean, if you can become successful, I mean, I guess now the bar's been set. <laughs> I'm if I'm reading the chat board. Maybe the Eagles trade Hurts. <laughs> we wouldn't be surprised. How many? No, how many? No, pl- not, how many playoff? Be surprised at all if that, if that took place. How many? Ga- how many playoff games has Kurt Cousins won? One. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's, True. that's correct. But uh, I'm just saying, if you're going to pay Dak 160, looks like the, the Chiefs got a deal with with Patrick. Yeah, and I think all those people out there from Kansas City should thank Philadelphia for letting Andy Reid go. <laughs> I yep. know it was the Kansas City uh, show that led into ours. That's just a little shout out to those guys. <laughs> um, yeah. Coach, Coach Reid was good for the Eagles. He just couldn't get us to that uh, ultimate goal. Over and, the hump. Hey, he we, pulled it off out there in Kansas City. So and, good for him. And his protege did bring us the Super Bowl, despite not being here anymore. He did bring us a Super Bowl, Doug. Yeah, and Doug was such a good coach the last couple of years that after he was let go by the Eagles, oh wait, no one did hire him. <laughs> he'll be making yeah, where, where, he'll where be Doug, making five million next year from his uh, mansion in Florida. Oh, I, I heard he was going to be be on the uh, post game live. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be filling in on post game live with uh, with Michael Barkan and. Question from Marcus on the chat board. Would you say Cousins is better than Dak? No. 
<laughs> I, I don't think I don't think he's be, he's better than no, than, than Dak Prescott. I mean, I think I think Dak has has, has shown. Well, I, I guess the thing would be is too with Dak Prescott. I guess a lot of it there is he he has shown a lot of potential, and it just seems in some big games though that he, whether it's whether it was his fault or other problems with the Cowboys, things just didn't turn out the way that everyone thought that they would. When you look at a lot of times in the preseason, everyone's expecting Dallas to do big things, and that just they just haven't lived up to it. Uh, they haven't lived up to it for the past 20 years. No, they haven't. When, when you would look at the fact that, okay, before, because I guess Elliott was, was or is the highest paid running back, and now if they have the highest paid quarterback, yeah. what's next? C.D. Lamb, the highest paid wide receiver, I guess. <laughs> So let's get back yeah. to let's get back to the Eagles. Which is... Yeah, the question I had though when when um, that came to mind with bringing up CD Lamb, do you? I, I know when we look at players from drafts. Okay, last year the Eagles took uh, Jalen Rager, and the Cowboys took CD Lamb. Now, if you flip the two, do you think the players? You know, we'd be saying the same thing that okay, well, CD Lamb wasn't the best player. It was Justin Jalen Jefferson. Rager. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <sighs> C.D. Lamb had a had a good first season, not a great first season. Rager was, you know, hampered by injuries, but th- you know he he looked great as a punt returner <laughs> was, yeah, against Green Bay. Against Green Bay. In, the, in the Green Bay game, he did. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Justin Jefferson was clearly clearly the the best player on the board at the time they picked Jalen Rager, and the scouts tried telling Howie that, but Howie Roseman wanted to make it his pick. Well, and the thing too was on on draft night, everyone was talking about how fast the guy would be, and uh, I didn't. I don't think I saw that last year. And, and the thing is, he didn't, he didn't. He didn't have an injury to his legs. Right, and they did They also didn't put him in a position to go deep. They kept him in a, in, in twenty yard patterns, partly because the quarterback had no time. Either quarterback, Carson or Jalen, there was no. The offensive line was in shambles. I think they started a different offensive line in what thirteen straight weeks, an NFL record. Yeah, and that's 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 difficult to do. But but you're right, Carson uh, was he was in a tough position with uh, the pass rush that he was up against on on most plays. But then again, if you looked at how the plays were being called, there was no there was a lot of plays that kept him in the pocket that probably shouldn't have. Well, and his his mobility is not what it was in his rookie season and second season. I don't know if it was the back injury the. The, head, the, head, the concussion, the, the injuries just mounted on Carson. He he aged quicker than anybody thought he would. I mean, he was hurt every season in college. I believe he was injured in high school. I, I that could that, that was on their mind when they drafted Jalen Hurts. You had the, the, the Eagles brass might have been saying, "Listen, this guy can't get through a season. We have to pick a quarterback," and that's what they did. They picked Jalen Hurts and. When you draft a quarterback number in the second round, he's going to be your quarterback. There's no, there's no two ways around it. He's going to get in the game. And Carson was playing with fo- hearing footsteps. It, it couldn't have been a comfortable situation. You get given a contract like that, and then they draft the quarterback in the second round. It's, there, there's, they back themselves yeah, into I, a corner. I, I guess, I guess that, that that question probably has never been answered because when whenever that went back to talking to people from the Eagles. It was always the comment was made, well, we were getting him because we wanted to have a solid, reliable backup. And I just don't think that that was a true statement. No. And, and it's true. I mean, even though even though a few seasons, I mean, Carson played well. I mean, the Super Bowl season, I mean, he was potentially the MVP of the league before he got hurt. Absolutely. And then if you go back, if you go back to the season before when he carried a bunch of guys off the practice squad into the playoffs and – who knows if they win that game against Seattle? They're at home, and he, right. got, he got hurt five plays into the game. So right. who knows if they win, if they win that game or not? On a cheap shot, I know I'm not going to call that injury prone. That was a cheap shot. It could have happened to anybody. But well, yeah, that yeah. that that shot would have concussed any quarterback right. in the league. Right. <laughs> and no, it, it was just it was just that curious thing too of of, of why of why they took took J, Jalen Hurts then in the second round. But uh, I mean, he he looked like. A different quarterback than, of course, Carson Wentz with the way he was able to run this year in the few games that we saw him. So, and if they're going to build around him, it looks like they're putting together an offensive line that's going to be able to protect him a little bit better. Yeah, it's 
they're putting together an offensive line, I think, out of necessity. You can't you can't have a guy go into his second year in the league and, and get beat and then get beaten up. It'll ruin his confidence. It'll ruin his probably the rest of his career. You have to have a guy back there with a pocket. You have to give him a chance. And I think th- talking about giving him a pocket and giving him time, you have to draft a wide receiver. There's no two ways around it. We have to draft a wide receiver. We can't mess around with a cornerback like Patrick Sartain. We can't... We can't draft a quarterback. It's going to be the fourth or fifth best quarterback at that point. We have to go receiver. Jamar Chase goes five to Miami. We have to take the best. You, you want Waddle? I'll take Waddle. You want Devontae yeah, Smith? Thanks. I'll take Devontae Smith. Whatever they think is the best player, I don't think you can go wrong with either one out of Alabama. Yeah, I'm not so sure that I agree 100% with that. Okay. I, I mean, I, I think I would love to see the Eagles with a dominant wide receiver, and I don't know. Uh, it's, I don't know. The way I'm looking at this team now, I'm thinking that maybe the best offense that they can have is to have a good defense. Because I don't know how many games I've watched where it just seemed like teams could go up and down the field on the Eagles whenever they wanted. And every time a quarterback dropped back to throw a long pass, it was complete because there was no one back there to cover. Um, it's, it's an interesting conversation because when sure. you look at the team, it's like, yeah, they do need a wide receiver, but they need help on defense. And they, they need all this help. And boy, well, it's a shame. It's a shame they have to need a wide receiver because they shouldn't need one. They should have drafted no. D- DK Metcalf instead of JJ Arcega Whiteside. We said that then. Right. They should have drafted Justin Jefferson. Look at that. Look at the roster you'd have there. Justin Jefferson and and, and D- DK Metcalf. I think you'd still have Carson Wentz here if they were your receivers. That, 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 that's probably true. That you probably do. Yeah. And then and then you wouldn't have had to waste the second round pick last year on Jalen Hurts, and who knows what that second round player could be because exactly. he could have been someone to help bolster your defense. And now we're looking at a team that was possibly uh, in the playoffs, especially in the how bad that division was last year. Yeah. And well, it's a, it's all woulda, shoulda, coulda right now. And I, I think we're looking at a at a at a, at a great thirty for thirty with. Uh, when this Eagles management's out of here, when you can get Howie Roseman and sit him down, and I, I want to hear who made these picks. <laughs> I'd like to hear the thinking behind these draft picks. Yeah, because it, it never came back to the fact that, okay, well, this person made the pick and everybody else was on board with it. It always seemed like the pick was made, and then there was like, what? Who did you take? Exactly. Uh, sports fa- sports like- fans such as ourselves sit, sat there and said, Who? When they picked J.J. Arcega Whiteside, I said, are you kidding me? And and I think last year, too, the the, the surprising thing was where they did talk a lot about, about trying to get C.D. Lamb. I think there was the availability for the Eagles to move up last year to possibly get him. But that, that was talked about a lot through the media and through a lot of sports fans about trying to move up and get C.D. Lamb. But C.D. Lamb wasn't who the Eagles wanted. Which is which was stunning to anybody who was trying to follow what the Eagles needed, and then all of a sudden the guy from a uh, TCU was picked, and it was like, who? I know. And and Minnesota oh, said thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yes, they did. <laughs> and they're going to be they're probably going to be thanking us for the next ten years. Exactly. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't know. I guess the discussion when you look at the draft coming up, oh, shit. with how many uh, players they need, I'm I'm the one who says look. Stick with the six pick. Don't trade out of it to get more picks. I think they. I think it, at the six pick, you can't go wrong. But then again, with who's making the picks for the Eagles, it's possible. Entirely. All right. And the NFL is moving towards a seventeen-game season this year, also. Yeah, is that going to be? Is that going to be with one one bye week as well? I. They haven't finalized it, but I think they would most likely add a second bye week. Yeah, or or, or eliminate a preseason game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Try yeah. and try and try and eliminate some of those uh, preseason games. Yeah, and I don't know if they're going to keep the same uh, format for playoff teams or not this year. I I don't think that's been finalized either. I think it has to be done at the uh, collective bargaining. Yeah, because last year, last year only the uh, top seed in each conference got the bye right. in the playoffs, correct? Yes. yes. When before, when before it was, a, yeah, it was the top two teams, and they yeah. went and they had changed it up. So, yep. all right, we got we got a couple minutes left in the show. I, I wanted to do a something a little different. Uh, talk a little, um, talk a little racing. Talk a little NASCAR. racing. Look a little NASCAR. I know there's a lot of NASCAR fans out there in the Philadelphia area. Um, this year's gotten off to a 
to a um a crazy start to say the least with um Michael McDowell winning in Daytona with Christopher Bell with Kyle Larson all the big name drivers are just not coming to the top so far the um the, oh, and the, the main guy who I'm interested in and, and have been for a long time in NASCAR has been Denny Hamlin I mean he may be leading the points right now but he uh he probably could have won a race or two so far this year if his pit crew had been a little bit better, or if he didn't get what I thought was a bogus penalty in a race in, in the race uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. But it's early in the season, and um, big race coming up on Sunday out in Phoenix. Yep, Phoenix, where uh, Kevin Harvick has dominated over the years. Yeah, that's, that's the Kevin Harvick track out there. Yep. I know. What, what else? What, all, what else is hurting the drivers? Is we're not having qualifying. So there's no qualifying for these races. There's no practice runs for these races. These these cars are coming off the trailers and going right to the right to pit road, and they have to make the adjustments in race, which is hurting guys like Kyle Busch. It's hurting guys like Denny Hamlin. They, they're not going into the race with the finely tuned car and just going out there and running the race. They're worried about making adjustments. And by the time they make these adjustments, it could be too late. The track could change. So it's it's been a tough season with the COVID, and, and hopefully they get back to qualifying and the practice and, you know, the cream will come to the top again yeah and i'm not sure if uh the way when, when looking at it now with some of the new guys winning early here if that's going to attract more fans if that's good for it for the sport or if it's better to have four or five guys who seem to dominate and everyone else is chasing them but yeah. it's interesting how it started and we'll see how it plays out i mean that's one thing with nascar the season is is not short it's not it's not Aaron checking in. Kyle Larson absolutely killed it in Vegas. Yes, he did. Love seeing him on dirt last season. We're going to see him on dirt this season in Bristol. That should be exciting. Yes, we are. And that, that should be another inter- interesting race, and uh, possibly he'll be the favorite by the time that rolls around. Yep. So, all right, we got a few minutes left. Yeah, 8.54. We've got about six minutes left in the show. Hopefully uh, our first show here on uh, Philly Sports Talk here on IE Sports Radio has gone well. And hopefully in the future we'll be getting some more people into the chat room and more people interested in the show because we're going to try to do our best to, to promote this and talk about everything we can from Philadelphia sports. And as you can see, we even touch on NASCAR. Yep. But you probably you probably won't find that on many of your local Philadelphia sports stations. I'd say never. <laughs> well, True. One last thing I wanted to talk about was um something me and Chris have been working on um even before this we I, I've always had an idea of having a show live while the games are being played. I, that's something that I've we've never had in in any sports talk um radio station. So, something that we can all sit and watch the game on the TV and talk about on the on on an app, and I, we we found that app. That app's called Telegram. We have we started our own um, channel on there. It's called Philly Sports Talk. Um, we're, we've been we're going to be doing the Sixers games for the second half of the season. And if you guys go to our Twitter page, Philly Sports Talk, there's a link on there, and that'll take you to the um, Telegram. You guys can sign up, join the group. I'll send you an invite, and we'll sit and talk live. We'll go into the playoffs every Sixers game. We'll talk about MB. We'll talk about Simmons. We'll talk about Harris. And the interesting thing about that is it's not one of those things where it's Twitter where you're just typing in and reading it. It's actual people who are watching the game and having a conversation and just come join us, and there's nothing expected from anybody. You just make your comments, make your opinions, and uh, we welcome as many people as, as we can. And then from transitioning from us there on Telegram, you guys come follow us here on IE Sports Radio, which is your direct feed for all things sports at Philly Sports Talk. Every Tuesday from 8 to 9. All right, that'll wrap it up, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Cash. He's Chris. Have a great night. We will talk to you next week. And remember, once again, you're listening to Philly Sports Talk right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all things sports. See you next week.